So it's very obvious that it's not you, it's him. But he does require us to have a strong will. You've heard the saying, um, where there's a will, there's a way. Oh, my dad used to say that all the time. Oh, where there's a will, there's a way. But th that's really truthful. That's really, and it, it's true also in the Bible. Because if you want, what it's saying is if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way to make it happen. I think Dr. Rena could come up here and talk about her life, and she will be a perfect example of that. But you have to have the will first. Can you put up that first slide? OK. So the kids can learn. And it's hard to learn just by words. So you set up a little example for them. So we'll have a little bit of an optic lesson at the end. And we'll see what, what goes. Uh, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord. That rain last night was just uh, wonderful. Uh, it came down and uh, quenched a parched earth. And uh, your mercies and grace is just so amazing. Uh, it's, it's beyond words. So this morning, Lord... Um, my prayer is that you open the eyes of our hearts and the ears of our hearts so we can hear your message, Lord. Like Elisha's servants asked Elisha, what are we going to do? We're surrounded by the enemy. And Elisha prayed, Lord, open the eyes of his heart. And he opened his eyes, and the hills were full of chariots of fire. The angels were there. So, we, Lord, we pray that your word will, we say, your word will not return void. It will accomplish the purpose of which you sent it. So, we praise you and we trust you and we go with your promise in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. Uh, oh, great. Um, the teaching this morning is, um, I entitled it, A Hero's Will Must Be Stronger Than His Skill. So your will needs to be stronger than your skill. But before we get started, uh, I want to ask the Tango to come up here, uh, Reagan, and tell us about his meeting with the youth. And could you come up? And um, what's planned and uh, when they meet again. I wish he had the pictures we could. So it's very obvious that it's not you. It's him. But he does require us to have a strong will. You've heard the saying, um, where there's a will, there's a way. Oh, my dad used to say that all the time. Oh, where there's a will, there's a way. But th that's really truthful. That's really, and it, it's true also in the Bible. Because if you want, what it's saying is if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way to make it happen. I think Dr. Rena could come up here and talk about her life, and she will be a perfect example of that. But you have to have the will first. Can you put up that first slide? OK. I didn't put the full picture up, but every time I see that, what you're seeing here is uh, a little girl, it's an actual photo, in southern Sudan. And the gentleman to the left is a man by the name of Kevin Carter. He was the photographer that took that picture. And uh, he scooched up close, very slow, about 10 meters, so he wouldn't scare the vulture away, and took that picture. Shoot it away, and then, of course, the vulture came right back. Kevin uh, didn't do anything for that girl. Oh, they said, you'll get a disease, or you just don't know. Wear the mask. You're going to get the virus, whatever. 
but he walked away. Now, there was a feeding station less than a mile away. Now, that photo was on the front page of Time Magazine, March 26th, 1993. And Kevin received a Pulitzer Prize for that photo. That's an honor. That's an honor. Matthew 24, put up the second one. No, just leave that up. Leave that up. No, don't go to the second one. Matthew 24, 28 says, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. The vulture is a symbol used in the Bible for judgment of shame. It's also the gathering of the vultures is talked about a diseased spiritual life. I remember a church we went to. Uh, we used to go, you know, whenever the doors were open, we went to church because we loved going to church. We just loved it. Uh, as you can see by the empty seats here. Uh, but we used to go. And just because we wanted to be in God's house, bottom line. And I remember one Wednesday, I don't know if Lan remembers it, uh, we got there Wednesday evening, they had a service, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday evening, remember that? They used to do that. Now they did away with the Wednesday night, they call it a family night, and they, you know, all. But anyway, we pulled up, I remember that it was, a, I think it was in August even, it was, a, it was in the evening, it was still light, and we pulled up, and this was a large church, so the parking lot was getting filled with people going in. And I looked to my right as we dro drove in off the main road, and I don't tell you what church or what road, then you'll know, and there was a car that was stopped with the uh, hood up. There was a man and a lady in there, a young man and a lady. And I noticed the man had really long hair. And um, I sat there for a while. Lan went in ahead of me, and I watched, because I said, I'm going to go over and talk to them. But I sat and watched, and I saw car after car, person after person, walk right past them, not say a word, not say a word, and walk into church. And I sat there until the last car rolled in. And embarrassingly, I went over and said, hey, can I help you guys? What, what do you need? You know? And we talked, and they had somebody come in, whatever it was. I said, well, do you want to come in and worship with us? And no. And I said, well, you know, we would really love to have you, you know. And if I can help you, just get in there and help me. And I told the pastor about that after the service. I also told him about a dream that I had. And I don't get many of them, but I had a dream of this church, and they had glass doors like we have. And the dream was that Jesus was standing at those doors, banging on them, trying to get in. And he couldn't get in. And Shortly after that, and this is what reminded me of this, we had, there was a function outdoors that they would do, the church was doing, and I was talking with one of the pastors, they had many pastors, and I looked up, and there was a circling of vultures up in the sky, and I started talking to him about that. And he said, oh, you know, and I didn't make my mind of it until I just started doing this lesson. The Lord spoke to me, he says, there truly was a diseased spiritual life there. It was diseased. Now, this man, Kevin, received a phone call shortly after he got the Pulitzer Prize. Kind of like a hey guy call. And the person at the end of the line said, there was more than one vulture in this picture. The second vulture was behind the camera. What would you have done? This is in the Sudan, that little girl. I don't know what happened to her. I tried to find out. I read that her parents were gone. They were unloading food off a plane. I don't know if she lived, if she died, what happened with her. But what would you have done? Now, a year after he got a Pulitzer Prize, Kevin took his life. He drove with his pickup, 
to a place where he was raised as a child in California, ran a hose from the tailpipe inside the car and killed himself. And that diseased spiritual life brings us to Haggai. Short little book in the Old Testament. Read it. It's really interesting. Just like all of us, and just like Kevin, we're caught up in our routines of life. Now, remember what happened here. 50,000 of them left Babylon. They were in captivity. That was their home. They left, and they came to Judea. And they went and they built an altar in Jerusalem, and they were attempting to build a temple. Remember, the last one was Solomon, and that was destroyed. And they got as far as the foundation, and that was it. They were caught up in what we get caught up in, everyday life, the things that we want, the Pulitzer Prizes, all of the things that we chase after. They started chafing after, but not just the people, the leadership, the governor, Joshua, the priest, the high priest, they were drifting the same. They were all the same until Haggai enters the picture. And put up uh, um, number three. And Haggai says, announces this to them. He says, the Lord of hosts said, consider your way. Consider your way. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified. Remember Nehemiah? He tried doing it, too. This was the warning. And they said, how can we build a temple? I mean, come on. How can we build a, go up to the mountain? We can't build a temple like Solomon. That's not what God was asking. See, God was asking about two temples, the temple here first and the temple here. That's where your main concern should be. You see, they thought, we can't do it with Solomon. You know, when David got all the supplies, and we can't do that. God said, do it. I'll provide a way. And they built the temple. Interesting enough, 500 years later, Jesus walked through that temple. Walked through that temple. You know, you think of drifting. We're drifting away. We know that we can't be happy without God. We know that. But we still drift. And number one is we don't want to hear God's word. We really don't. We want to drown it out. But anyway, I was thinking about that last night. And I was praying about it. And then I get a message at 11.30 at night from Basilea, 1130 at night. He says, well, I'm trying to download your, your sermon, and it's, it's marked private. I can't do it. Da, da, da. So I sent him a different copy. But what I thought was, here's this young kid, 1130 at night. He's not out running the streets. What is he doing? He's setting things up for today, for the Sabbath. Uh, it just, I thought, because I was getting a little depressed. I said, thank you, Lord. And then this morning, I get this thing from, from Regan, and I said, double thank you. There are heroes. And that's how heroes operate, just like that. Go put up number four. This one's a good one. This one is a dandy. Okay, this is Luke 12, 15, 21. And it says this, and listen carefully to it. Then he said to them, this is Jesus, red letter, watch out. Uh, you know, when the Lord says watch out, I would tend to listen. When I say watch out, eh, you don't get ignore me. But when Jesus says watch out, I would tend to watch out. He said, be on guard against all kinds of greed. See, that's what's happened. That's what happened with Kevin. That's what happened with the children of Israel. All types of greed, life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Let the doctor tell you. Let Dr. Rena say, I'm sorry, 
You have a week to live. You tell me your car is going to be important to you. What's going to be important to you? I'll tell you what's important to you. What you did for eternity. What you did for the Lord. The people's lives that you touched. No one's going to come to your bedside or if you pass away and say, oh, I remember Fred. Um, he was a good singer. Or I remember. They come and they remember one thing about you. They remember how you made them feel. And you can't have a better honor than he say that, you know what? Reagan asked me to come to this thing. And I, I learned about God. I saw God. That's what they remember. That's what they remember. Let's go on. This is, this is, this is a dandy, but it's a typical. It's us. Jesus hit it right on the head. That was a home run right out of the park. 17. He thought to himself, that's this farmer, what shall, I counted up the eyes and mives. That's all this whole thing is, I, me, 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 I, I, me, me. Okay, so you know where this is going, risk by that. Okay, so he says in 17, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I, I have no place to store my crop. Now, but you have to go back to 16, which I didn't read. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. The rich man had nothing to do with it. It was the ground that yielded it. You know who did it? God did. He provided the rain. He provided the soil. He provided the nutrient. He put a little fertilizer on the fine. He provided the protection from the pestilence. But he said, he said, I told you, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant ground. Now he goes. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. 18. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. Oh, oh don't, we, don't we store our surplus grain? Oh, boy, we do. 19. And I, again, then and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Got a lot of money in the bank account? Did the doctor say you were doing pretty good? He said, I'll lay up for many years. And he says, now I have to take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, what does Jesus say in this parable? Look at 20. You know, you can call me a lot of names, but I don't want to be called this. I mean, being a teacher and a principal, kids say all kinds of stuff. Parents do. But I would not want to be called this. All right? But God said to him, you fool. Is he talking to us? You fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Who then will get what you have prepared for yourself? He got a Pulitzer Prize. Wonderful. You know what? Do you know who got it in 1994? Uh, no. 95? No. We don't know, and we don't really care. He said this. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God, and that's what we're really talking about. If you want to be a hero, you can't. You have to be rich towards God in time, and money, and everything. And we'll take a look at that in our lesson. Could put up six. It's like this. Everybody has an ATM machine, all right, in their house. You go to the ATM machine this morning, you take out a coin. Now, you have to spend that coin today, and you have to choose how you're going to spend it. Now, the question is, how many coins, Faisa, do you have in your machine? How many coins do I have in my machine? How many coins do you have in your machine? We don't know. Well, Fred, you're old, so you don't know. We don't know. If you're going to die tomorrow, I'm a lot younger than you are. So we don't know how many coins are in there. All we know is in the morning, we go and we get one coin. And we could choose what we want to do with that coin. It's your choice. The rich farmer had a choice. Kevin had a choice. The people Haggai were talking to had a choice. We always have a choice. 
And I'm telling you, you talk about money. That's talked about more in the Bible than anything. And where was Jesus looking at the widow with the copper coins, the widow's uh, mite? That's what he was looking at. Not because he needed money, because it was a matter of the heart. So we have a choice. We can live wisely for God or not. You know, and we have choices. And some are bad and some are good. But there's other choices, such as some are good and some are best. So we get to make those choices. OK, all kinds of heroes. Can you put up six? I don't know if you watched the Olympics. Um, these two young ladies, um, a thing Mo, she won the uh, 800 women's uh, race. And uh, Ravine Rogers won the bronze, those two young ladies. Both of them tweeted, thanks for the Lord. You know, they, 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 they loved the Lord, and they were competing for him. But when we think of a hero, we think of champions, we think of athletics. And, and there's nothing wrong with athletics. Trust me, athletics are wonderful. But Mo broke the American record for the 800. She got, did it in one minute, 55 seconds, point 22. New American record. Now, you know what? That record's going to get broken. Who had the record before her? And who had the record before her? Who broke the four-minute mile? Where is he? God doesn't care about that. He cares about their attitude, but he doesn't care about that. So when we're talking about heroes, we've got to take a look when we're talking about heroes. And I'm not saying they're not heroes. They're wonderful. Phenomenal young ladies. But there's also another way. We're talking about biblical heroes. <clears throat> so when we look at, at these young ladies, we have to go again. The will must be stronger than the skill. Now, how many of us in here, raise your hand, are going to be able to compete in the Olympics in the 800 or in anything? Any takers? No, none of us are going to. None of us. But we're competing in a race. And it's greater than the Olympics. It's greater than the Olympics. But remember, where there's a will, there's a way. And if you want it bad enough, it'll happen. And I truly believe it. I can go on about what happened in my life. And I'm sure many people can have the same stories. Put up number seven. See, if you want to be a hero, it requires something of you. When you look at that picture, who did you notice more? Not I went right down to the one on the bottom, the single, the one that's standing alone. Not the whole group up on top. You see, so if you really want to be a hero, you have to be willing to stand alone. No matter what, you have to be willing to stand alone. And then and then only will you realize what you stand for. And the Lord is constantly, constantly testing us and calling us to do these things, not so we fail the test, and if we do, fine, but to pick us up so we become stronger the next time. How many people, poor Peter, how many times did he deny Jesus? But he was on fire for the Lord, you know. So you have to be willing to stand alone without a question. We don't worry about the empty seats. We worry about the souls, but it's not about that. It's not about big. You see, it's nobodies, which we are, who knows somebody. You remember that song by Casting Crowns, Nobody? The drunk sitting on the roadside, the wine all drinking, everybody's come by, told them about the Lord. The nobody that knew somebody. And that we do. We have the right connections. We have the right connections. So what makes a hero successful in God's eyes? Now, number one would be the word of God, reading the word, trying to understand it, and living by it. That's why you're here. That's why you go to Bible study. And what about Bible studies? How many are there when we do it online? Are you there? We have, uh, we have a group in our house. We have uh, three people show up. And many of these 
Bible studies, all you have to do is just dial it up on the phone. There's two, three, four, five people. That's it. But you have to be seeking the word and learning. That's important, okay? Put up eight. Okay, look at these verses. The first one is James, for, uh, James 1, 22. But do not be just doers of the word, and uh, be, uh, excuse me, but be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. We hear it, and we hear it, we hear it. We hear preaching, we hear it. But then we go out, and we do what we're going to do, just like the people of Haggai. They drift away. But we know that. So how do you do it? You continually stay in the word. Instead of watching CNN or some movie, I'm not saying it's bad to watch a movie, turn it off and start reading about the Lord. I don't know. That, that, that's a no-brainer to me. I, I remember when I like golf. I do. I turn on everything. I study about golf, 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 golf. Number two, 2 Timothy 3, 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced to it. Continue in it. Stay convinced. Satan comes in and likes to steal it away and create lots and lots and lots of doubt. Don't let him do it. Colossians 2, 6, keep the roots deep, deep in the Lord so Satan can't trick you. That's the only thing he can do is trick you. And that's what he did to all of these people. Okay, Revelation 3, 3, remember, therefore, what you have received, heard, obey it, and repent. And 4, Proverbs 4, 13, hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. So what are we doing with our life? Not a whole lot. So listening to the voice of God, this is interesting. Now look at these people we're talking about, these heroes, just a few, because we can't be here all day. But look at Moses. So what did Moses, God tell Moses, Moses use the rod. David use the slingshot. Huh. Strange things to use, aren't they? Elisha, use the mantle. Shamgar, the eight-foot stick. Now, Shamgar, you, everybody know who Shamgar is? Shamgar was a leader, a ruler of Israel. He was also a judge. Shamgar is not a Jewish name. They say, they don't know for sure, they say that he was a child of a temple prostitute. And here he's leading the nation of Israel. Now, it says he used an eight-foot stick. It was called an ox goad. What did he do with that? He killed 6,000 Philistines with an ox goad. And that is an eight-foot stick with a sharp end. And they would go the, the oxen to keep them moving when they stopped. Jab him, back of the leg. Jab him. He killed 8,000 Philistines. And what does the Bible say about him? Not a lot. But it said this. He, too, saved the Jews. He, too, saved the Jews. Who is he? What did he do? With a stick. You can do anything. Absolutely anything is what he's saying. We got to defeat the enemy. So look, look at Gideon. Oh, my goodness. Gideon, Utah, now here's a, uh, a judge. And he was a leader. And he was a frightened leader. The Midianites took over the land. Everything the Jews had, they stole. If they went in the wine press and made wine, they came and took it. When they harvested the grain, they took it. So where, when the angel comes to Gideon, where is he? He's in the wine press. What's he doing? <laughs> He's shucking the grain. Now, you can't do that in a wine press. You've got to do that open so the wind can take the hole away. But he's down there. Why is he down there? Because he's frightened. And the angel comes to him, O mighty man of valor, O 
hero. God wants you to lead an army to defeat these invaders, these Maidans. Me? You? You're a coward. How can you do that? So he says, OK, all right, Lord. Remember, he did the fleece and all that stuff. So he says, OK, I'll raise an army. He raises an army of 32,000, which is meager to the Maidans. They said, when they talked about them, they said they had so many camels that they couldn't count them. It was like grains of sand on the beach. It was such a huge army, OK? So the Lord says, uh-uh, that's not working. 32,000. Those that are frightened, let them go home. Would you have gone home? You want to be in a battle for the Lord? You prepared? 22,000 left. So now he has 10,000. Do you feel small as a church? 10,000. So the Lord says, mm, too big. Now, you've got to understand the size of this army they're going against. Too big. So you go down to the, take them down the creek and have them drink water and watch. Those that kneel down like a dog and lap the water, send them home. Those that bring it up to their face, have them stay. 9,700 knelt down. That leaves us 300 for his army. Were they victorious? Yes, they were. What did they do? They blew trumpets and broke jars and made noise, confused the enemy, and they killed themselves. Was that Gideon? No. That was God. So don't tell me you can't do it. You can break a jar, can't you? All right, yell. David. He tells David, move forward. He tells Joshua, march in a circle. So all of his instructions are different for each person. So you have Gideon, stand still, because he never went in. <laughs> they were defeated. And you have, you have uh, David moving forward, and you have Joshua going in circle. Now, that must, he must have thought, that's something with Jericho. Uh, that's going to be a winner. But did the walls come tumbling down? Hmm. I think they did. How do we get victory? He told Noah, get in the boat. He told Peter, get out of the boat. He told Paul and the prisoners, hang on to the boat, the pieces of the boat, so you can survive. Everything is different. There's no set thing. You don't train and do one thing always the same. That's why you have to be able to hear the Lord. OK, we're called to proclaim the good news. Philip. Unbelievable. They were coming by the hundreds in Samaria. He said, leave. Leave. What? Go down that dusty road and see the eunuch, right? So Philip, he says, leave. Peter and John, he says, enter Samaria. The other apostles, he says, remain and stay in Jerusalem. So you have leave, enter, and stay. See, God's plan is not our plan. It's just not. But if you don't pick up the ox goad and be willing to go, he told David, imagine this little kike, really, honestly, with a sling and a rock, go forward into that, to that 10-foot giant. Are you kidding? Nah, I think I got to go. My daddy's calling me. I got to go out there and look at the sheep. Uh -uh. You, come on, you come at me with sword, spear, and javelin, and I come at you in the name of my God. You're not going to mock my God. Period. There you go. So it's key. What's key here is hearing the Holy Spirit speak, lead, and guide. John 16, 13, this is red letter scripture, says this. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all the truth, all the truth. And he will not speak in his own authority, but whoever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are coming. And there are things coming. There are things coming, for sure. This, this is a, uh, I keep this at my house. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of the Titanic. 
and I'm sure I'm not going to go into the story of Titanic. I think everyone knows the story of the Titanic. But it was a ship that the owner said, before it left Southampton to go to New York, he said, God cannot sink this ship, is what his words were. Okay? It was built as the best and the most safe ship ever built. It had compartments. So if it sprung a leak in the front, there's another compartment, pump it out. So it was unsinkable. Hmm. But it sank. What happened was there was a, there was a ice, iceberg. You know, icebergs, you see the little tip, but underneath it's huge. They spotted it. They weren't alert, but anyway, they spotted it. And they turned the ship so they wouldn't hit the iceberg. And underneath, the iceberg just ripped the side of the ship. And the crew went down and looked and said, you know, to put the pumps on, uh-uh, uh-uh, we're sinking. There's nothing we could do. So they went back up and they told us. They told us. Many were sleeping. Get out, get out, we're sinking. It didn't even like the ship even, you know, nudge. They came out, they looked, huh? Everything's normal. Is everything normal today? Everything's normal. They're down, look, you look out, they're down in the ballroom, they're dancing, drinking, all of that. No, no, get out. Get out, get into the lifeboat. Do you know that most of the lifeboats either went with a few people, some were even empty. They wouldn't get in them. They wouldn't get in them because all seemed normal. And that's how it is today. All seems normal. How could this be? How can this be? It is being. It's coming. As a matter of fact, we have already hit the iceberg. Right now, what we're doing is putting deck chairs out on the Titanic, because it is going down. No man can save it. One person can save it, and that is God. That is God. But I'm telling you something. It's not normal. Open your eyes and see what is happening. We hit it. But we can sleep in our cabin. Me, I'm heading for the lifeboat. Matter of fact, I'm in the lifeboat. And the lifeboat is Jesus Christ. No matter what happens. You get you, you get your family, you get your neighbor, you get your school, you get everybody into that lifeboat because we're sinking. I'm telling you, we can, just like 9-11, we can come down before we get out of this service. And I mean, look what happened to our gas. Uh, I don't want to get into it. But anyway. We have to be able to hear these words. Uh, put up nine. We're coming to an end here. Okay, Isaiah 30, 21. Whether, listen, this is interesting. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind saying to you. I thought it was an interesting saying, because usually the shepherd leads the sheep. He doesn't lead them from behind. And here, in Isaiah, he's saying, you'll hear the voice behind. It's interesting. I went to an acupuncture uh, for ringing in the ear, you know, um, and for my hearing. And when she talked to me to check my hearing, she went behind me. And if you've ever had a hearing check, they talk, because a lot of times we read lips, you know, they go behind you, see? So God is talking behind us. He wants to know if you're really listening or you're reading other things, the world and the things around you. So it's interesting that Isaiah is saying this. He says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Now, remember Elijah and Jezebel? He killed all those uh, priests of Baal, and he takes off running, and he's looking for God, and he goes to Mount Horeb. And he's looking all for God, and he goes out, and he said, there's a fire, God's not there. There's an earth blowing, boom. There's an earthquake, God's not there. And then he comes out of the cave, pulls the, his hood up over his head, and from behind, he hears a still, 
small, gentle voice. He wasn't hearing God. He wasn't hearing it. God wanted to hear him. So we have to have a relationship with, with God, not a head knowledge. We have to have a heart knowledge. You know, when Jesus walked this earth 33 years, not many people knew who he was. All of the holy people, all of the Pharisees, the scribes, and all these, uh, all these rabbis, he's right there. He went right by on the dog. They had no clue who he was. Do you ever wonder why is that? I always thought, well, the light will attract. I'll know Jesus. I'll know that angel. Who was that child on the ground? But they had no clue. Who did Jesus go to? He goes to the shepherds. You announce my coming. The shepherds, the lowest class of people there were were the shepherds. That's who Jesus goes to. They have to announce Jesus' birth. God wants them to do it. He sends the magi to it there to bring glory to him. Look at Mary and Joseph, common girl. Angel appears to her. You are most favored to God. Simeon and Anna, look at this. You know who they are, Simeon and Anna? Simeon is a priest, okay? And God spoke to him in a dream and said, before you die, Simeon, I will reveal the Messiah. And Anna was a good friend of his. Every day, this man was old. He made me look young. Every day he'd go to the temple thinking, this is the day. Mm -mm. This is the day. No. Well, maybe next Tuesday. Yeah. Sunny day, maybe. On and on and on. And then one day, he was in the temple doing the temple duties and a young man and a young lady walked in by the name of Joseph and Mary, and they brought baby Jesus in. And that dream was answered before he died. He held the creator of the universe in his hands and prophesied over him. God is faithful to what he says he will do in your life. He is faithful. You keep showing up. You keep showing up. You keep being there. How about the Samaritan woman? I mean, we can go on. This is just a few. She's the one Jesus told out of everyone, I'm the Messiah. He tells her, the prostitute, the woman at the well. His disciples are out running around getting food. They don't know what's going on. They have a clue. She does. He tells her. What does she do with the news? She runs. Leaves her jugs of water and says to people, come, let me show you. Come see, come see. And it says, the Bible says, because of her, many believed. Why does he choose a sinner, a prostitute, five husbands, a Samaritan? Why does he choose that? Can he choose us? I think so. I definitely qualify under that. And then Bartimaeus, the blind man. He's blind. People are going by. And he said, what's going on? He says, oh, Jesus is another. Jesus is going by. Jesus, Jesus, son of David, Jesus, son of David. He knew who Jesus was. His disciples say, shut up, keep quiet. Nobody in that crowd knew who he was except the blind man. And he says, what's wrong? <laughs> what do you need? I want to see. He says, you have sight. I mean, he has better sight than anybody. The eyes of his heart, not the eyes of his head. Isn't that interesting? So really, the whole thing is that it takes more than simply coming to church and doing religious things to have and put on Christ's mind. So there's some ways. Now, the disciples, they didn't understand. And it's probably, I would call this probably the greatest misunderstanding. They didn't have a clue. They were with Jesus. They ate with him, slept with him, saw all the miracles, did all of those things. They had no idea that he was to die on the cross and suffer and be resurrected. And he had, they had no clue. Even when they walked into the empty grave with the grave clothes folded neatly, they had no clue. 
They talked with the angel before they went in there. They had no clue. It really wasn't until Pentecost. That's when they got it. That's when their minds were opened and they were able to see and to know what was going on. And John 15, 15, 16 says this, no longer do I call you servant, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friend. Now listen to this, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. But he's not going to entrust it to anyone. He's not going to entrust it to anyone. He doesn't need man. He needs, what did he tell the woman at the well? He needs a new worship, but one in spirit and in truth is what he wants. He said, you did not choose me. I chose you. He chose all of us out here. It's crazy. It's just crazy. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and that's souls and what you do for heaven. Okay, we're coming to an end here pretty quick. Put up 11. This is really kind of a neat one. Revelation 3.21 said, He had overcome. Will I grant to sit me in my throne, even as I also overcame, I am set down with my Father in heaven. So he's saying that if we overcome, if we do his will, remember? If we do his will, that we will be sitting in the throne with him. So in essence, right now we're training for reigning. It's what we're doing. It's crazy to be reigning. Okay, put up 12, and we're coming to an end here. 12, it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. It's not your power. It's his power. If he can get Balaam's donkey to do his work, he can sure get me and he can sure can get you. Okay? So you have to understand, that is available. Everything my father showed me, I will show you. Everything. That's what's available. But why do we not want it? So the question we have to ask in coming to an end before we uh, do our lesson our is this. He says, are you a true hero? You can be. You can't, you have to be able to imagine yourself as one. Where there's a will, there's a way. Put up that last one. So who are you? You really have to decide that. Are you a child of God? Is that are you of royal ancestry? Is that your father? Are you wanting to glorify him? You know what his heart wants. He wants everyone. He wants no one to perish, everyone to be saved. He wants you to scoop up that little girl in the Sudan and just take her and feed her and love her. And say, God loves you. He knows you're here. That's what he wants from us. See, Kevin, Kevin, the people with Haggai, the rich farmer, the list goes on. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. And I'm going to show you the reason why. Okay. Now, I'm going to put these rocks in this container. <laughs> That's full, right? But it's not. It's not full. See, so we could fit more in there.
Okay, full, but we can actually put more in there. See, so we can put sand in there now. That baby's full. Will you agree? Definitely. But it's really not. Because we can put water in there, right? So we can pour some water in. See, filling up. Now, what am I doing? What's the moral of this story? Now it's full. What's the moral of the story? What am I showing you? I asked a couple people this. I've done this before, and they say, well, when you think you're at the end, you can always do more. Anybody agree with that one? What's some other things? If you have a busy schedule, you can always find time. You can fit it in somewhere. But it's none of those. It's none of those. The moral of this lesson is this. If you don't put the big rocks in first, they will never fit. Say it again. If you don't put the big rocks in first, they will never fit. So if you fill your life with the gravel, the sand, the water, everything, just like the people of Haggai, just like all of them, the rich farmer, if you fill your life with that and you think then the big rocks are God, that's the big rock, the biggest one, and then the rest of the Bible. The rest then are feeding the poor, helping that little girl that's starving. Those are the big rocks. If they don't go in first, trust me, I will not get them in there. I won't get them in there. So what do I do with that? How do I do that? How can we, as just regular people, but heroes? Reagan found a way. OK, there's three things we need to do. And we close with these three. Start where you are. Use what you have. If it's an eight-foot ox goat, if it's a sling, if it's a basketball, whatever it is, a soccer ball, use what you have and do what you can. Again, start where you are. Start now. Start where you are. Use what you have. Well, I don't have a lot of money. You've got some money. You can help somebody. You can pray with someone. You can visit someone that's shut in. There's a trillion things you could do. OK, so start where you are. Use what you have, and you have plenty. Every one of us in here are blessed beyond imagination. Filthy rich compared to that little girl in the Sudan and many of the people in the Sudan. Would love to have what you're going to have for lunch, a, por a, a morsel of it. but probably more with someone knowing that someone loves them. And you can do that and do what you can. So we're all heroes if you want to be. <laughs> Little Basilea, he's a hero. Reagan's a hero. There's many in here. People singing the choir. People, we don't know what people do. There are many heroes. God knows. God knows. Um, are we let's see. We're supposed to do the, uh, um, I guess I'm going to do the um, offering. That's what it is. Right, the offering. So 